You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Finding Genius Podcast. My guest today is Sharmila Ananda Sapapathy. Uh, she's a doctor, professor of medicine and gastroenterology, director of the Baylor Global Initiatives and the Baylor Global Init- Innovation Center at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. And we're going to be talking about uh, her work. So, Sharmila, thank you for coming. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so if you don't mind, in, you know, uh, in summation, what, what's your work about? What's it about currently? And then we'll go a little bit into the background. Yeah, so there's two uh, broad areas that I focus on. One is uh, gastrointestinal cancers and specifically gastrointestinal cancer prevention, um, focusing mostly on esophageal cancer um, and stomach cancer and the development of lower cost, portable diagnostic uh, technologies uh, that can be used uh, in very uh, variable global settings to provide um, early detection of esophageal and gastric cancer. Um, and in this area, we also look at you know computer-assisted diagnostics and augmented reality um, for both training and early detection. Our focus is on imaging. Um, and my second focus, partly because we work in um, under-resourced areas of the world where uh, worldwide, um, is that um, I run our global health programs and look at the development of different technologies and approaches for addressing some of the leading challenges um, worldwide um, in terms of healthcare. So why um, esophageal and stomach cancer? I mean, there's many kinds of cancer out there, but what in particular draws you to this area? So, uh, because the reason that's my specific research focus is because I'm a gastroenterologist, and um, esophageal cancer actually is one of the the highest uh, rising cancers in the world. Um, there's two different kinds of it, but the one that's rising the most rapidly is due to acid reflux disease. There's a second type of it, which can be due to nutritional deficiencies and also um, environmental effects, alcohol and smoking. Both types of cancers are prevalent worldwide, and um, even more importantly, when they're diagnosed too late, um, the mortality rate from this is very high. Stomach cancer um, is also uh, very common globally. It's one of the top five cancers in under-resourced global settings. It is typically due to a a bacteria. Um, And um, this is also a leading cause of um, mortality, particularly in uh, lower resource settings worldwide. So it's an area of interest to me. And and so uh, the combination of technology, imaging, and uh, training the um, clinical workforce to be able to find those cancers and treat them um, has been the area of my work for over a decade. You said that uh, stomach cancer, one of the reasons for it is a bacteria. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, there's a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori, um, which is common actually um, worldwide. It's probably 
present in probably 80% of the population worldwide, and when it colonizes the stomach, it creates inflammation. It can actually lead to ulcers in the stomach. It can lead to bleeding from those ulcers in the stomach, and it can cause changes in the stomach, in the lining of the stomach, that um, eventually can lead to cancer um, in a small minority of patients. Not in everyone, though. Okay. And then... Um you mentioned acid reflux. Is that um, directly attributable to the rising level of stomach cancer or stomach cancer itself, or does that just appear to be, uh, you know, coincidental? I mean, what do you, in your estimation, what do you think are the drivers of the increase in stomach cancer, for instance? Yeah, so stomach and esophagus are completely different, and in fact, um, they segregate in very different areas of the world. So in parts of the world where there's high rates of stomach cancer, you don't actually see a lot of acid reflux-related cancers. And in areas of the world where there's high rates of esophageal cancer, you often don't see high rates of stomach cancer. So the, the acid reflux-related cancer um, is due uh, primarily to increasing um, uh, prevalence of the Western diet weight gain and obesity, um, which directly contribute to increased acid reflux and a condition called Barrett's esophagus, which you may have heard of. Barrett's is a sequelae of chronic acid reflux disease, and Barrett's esophagus is the primary precursor to esophageal adenocarcinoma, which is one of the highest rising cancers in the Western world. So um, what are some of the early signs that someone will have, you know, either esophageal or stomach cancer? What will they experience? Yeah, a little bit different, but uh, there's some overlap. So esophageal cancer is often hard to diagnose until a patient develops difficulty swallowing. Um, you know, prior to that, a patient may have experienced, you know, acid reflux, uh, heartburn, regurgitation over a period of years. Um, if they come in to see a gastroenterologist, often they will be scoped, and if Barrett's is diagnosed, they're scoped at regular intervals, usually three-year intervals. Um, and for patients who are in so-called endoscopic surveillance, where they're scoped regularly, there um, is a lower rate of progression to cancer. Um, but the patients that we do see with cancer have usually not been scoped, um, and they've had acid reflux disease for years, and their Barrett's was not diagnosed. Um, and those are more advanced cancers. And when the cancer is diagnosed at an advanced stage, um, and what I specifically mean is that it's reached the superficial lining of the esophagus and gone into the wall of the esophagus. So it's not in the paint, it's gone into the sheetrock, if I can use a, um, a, a, an analogy. Um, mm -hmm. Then there's an increased likelihood of involvement of the lymph nodes and the vessels, um, and the cancer is more advanced and the mortality rate um, skyrockets. Now, if the cancer is diagnosed when it's in the paint, um, superficially, the survival rates are well above 97%, and it can be treated through an endoscope, which is a huge difference. Now, similarly, stomach cancer is also another cancer which really should be diagnosed when it's superficial, again, in the paint and not in the sheetrock. Um, the symptoms are quite different. Patients with stomach cancer um, often are undiagnosed, but sometimes they develop um, abdominal pain. They may have difficulty um, uh, eating a full meal. They get, they get full quickly, and often they may present with anemia, lower levels of GI bleeding, um, from the tumor. This can happen with both esophagus and stomach. Um, but both of those cancers are very, very difficult to diagnose unless a patient undergoes endoscopy. And endoscopy is really the only way of diagnosing them early. Um, and because of that, um, that's why my group is really focused on developing endoscopic tools and technologies um, that can be portable, uh, that can be battery operated, that can be used by non-experts, and that can be used in um, lower resource settings of the world so that people can be screened for these cancers, um, even in areas of the world where they can't afford standard endoscopy, like in the United States. So what are some of the innovations and treatment that are going on right now? Yeah, so what we have been looking at, um, and we have taken it to clinical trial in some uh, settings worldwide, are kind of portable endoscopes or portable microscopic endoscopes. 
Um, these are tools that can work off of a cell phone or a tablet, and they can image the wall of the esophagus, and they can magnify the lining of the esophagus. I should actually add the esophagus or the stomach. Um, to about a 1,000x level of magnification. And when you do this, what you can actually see um, are the cells in the esophagus and the stomach. You can see a one millimeter area. Um, and you can actually distinguish cancer in, uh, from the normal tissue and see that cancer in real time. And our goal is not necessary to look for advanced cancers, but our goal is to look for some of the early um, superficial changes suggestive of pre-cancer or a very early cancer that is in the paint, again, not in the sheet rock, but in the paint, so that we can actually treat that um, pre-cancer or cancer through the scope um, at the point of care. So again, how, how do you treat the cancer through the scope? Would you, uh, I mean, I guess you could biopsy it, but what else can you do to actually treat it? Can you, I guess, code it selectively in spots where it's apparent to treat it yeah, you know, on a surface level? or? Yeah, and that is exactly what we hope to do. Um, so if we can see a cancer in real time, right, instead of waiting for a biopsy, say your endoscope can see a two millimeter area that harbors a precancer or a cancer, then through that endoscope, you can put an ablative device, um, either cryotherapy, which is low cost, which can be used for, uh, for freezing, or um, you can use heat, radio frequency ablation, or you can use endoscopic snares and tools for cutting, um, and that area can be selectively removed. And the advantage of these low-cost um, microscopic devices is that it's not only a way of seeing the precancer or cancer at a more early stage, it's also a way of um, delineating an area of abnormality so that you can treat it through the scope. You don't need to remove the whole stomach. So uh, are these treatments able to, I mean, make a big impact? And you know, just removing, I guess, again, uh, tumors in a local area, or does this require systemic treatment? You know, are these just like polyps or things, or like, what's the yeah. morphology of what you're what you're looking at, what you're doing? I would say it's even earlier than a polyp. So a polyp creates a lump or bump, right, which you can see with the naked eye. Um, you don't necessarily need a microscopic device magnifying the lining a thousand times to see a polyp because your eyes and my eyes could see a polyp because it's elevated. Uh, we actually want to see what happens before the polyp, the abnormal um, cellular changes, the tissue at a microscopic level, so we can actually treat that right away. And that can begin frozen, it can be burned, or it can be cut through the endoscope. Um, those procedures can be performed in less than an hour, and the patient can go home immediately. Um, so no surgery, no systemic therapy, and a survival rate well above 98%. Oh, wow. So that is that the end of the uh, situation for a lot of people, or do they, that, they continue correct. that that's, to come back? No, no, that's correct. That would be the end of the situation for most people. Um, in some cases where we use heat or cold, they undergo repeat sessions of treatment um, every couple weeks. But once that area is treated, the vast majority of patients are cured. Oh, that's great. Is this a new uh, type of treatment, or has this been in existence for a while? Well, the treatment mechanisms have been in existence for probably a little under a decade, but the diagnostic tools that we've been looking at, the microscopic devices and the portable endoscopes, those are all um, innovations that are coming out of um, work that we have been conducting um, at Baylor and with Rice University and their engineering team um, and have taken to clinical trial worldwide. And those are not commercially available yet, but that we're hoping that eventually they will be. Oh, uh, how long will it be until uh, there's this commercial availability of some of these? You know, what's your uh, I think we're going to see more of these um, hitting direct clinical care within the within the next um, five to seven years. I would say there are some comparable technologies and microscopic imaging technologies that are commercially available, but they're um, at a significantly higher price point, um, well over nine and $10,000, and some of the microendoscopic platforms are above 200000 U.S. dollars. We are trying to develop tools and technologies that are under $2,000. Endoscopes that cost under a hundred dollars, or microscopic endoscopes that cost, you know, a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars and can be reused. So very, very different price point we're working with. 
So is there any, um, you know, if someone comes to you and they're having gastro issues, you know, let's say it's not at the stage where they can't swallow or anything, but early on, you know, persistent heartburn, persistent regurgitation, those kinds of things. Is there anything they can do to prevent themselves possibly from having uh, you know, either esophageal or stomach cancer? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, heartburn is very common in the U.S., right? Um, this is a billion, billions and billions of dollar drug industry and all the acid blocking medications. Um, it's probably... Um, a safe estimate that over 15% of the American population experiences heartburn. Now, the problem is when that heartburn occurs regularly um, over a long period of time. Um, and if that happens, uh, someone should absolutely go in to see um, a physician or a gastroenterologist because it's the repeat injury from the acid into the esophagus that causes the changes um, that lead to Barrett's esophagus. Now, Barrett's is estimated to be in about 1% to 2% of Americans, so this is a common, common condition, but only a minority of those patients will ultimately go on to develop uh, cancer. So um, if someone continually has, uh, you know, let's say, acid reflux or heartburn, is it just this, this repeat stimulus of those environments that cause like a, like a mal maladaptation by the tissue that that leads to cancers, or what, what do you think is the whole mechanism? Yeah, that actually, you, you summarized it really well. It's a maladaptation, but it is an adaptation. So the, the lining of the esophagus is something called squamous. That's the normal tissue of the esophagus. What happens when it sees acid reflux every day? Now, the esophagus is used to acid, but when it sees acid reflux from the stomach every single day, because uh, the stomach is refluxing into the esophagus, patients are having regurgitation, they may have heartburn, they may have atypical symptoms such as cough or hoarseness or throat clearing. Um, these are all symptoms of reflux. When that happens every single day over a period of years, there is a change in the cells of the esophagus and they change from what we call a squamous epithelium, which tends to be thinner. Um, to what we call a columnar epithelium. This is more, um, the cells are more elongated um, and they resemble the intestine. Um, and the rest of the GI tract is this columnar epithelium, the stomach and the small intestine, the colon, but the esophagus is not supposed to have that epithelium, but it adapts that lining when it sees acid reflux. And that lining is to some extent more impermeable to the effects of the acid, but it is absolutely maladaptive because that columnar epithelium, which is called Barrett's esophagus, is the precursor to esophageal cancer. And what, what role so, do, um, for instance, like the epiglottis and the, uh, I guess, the, the sphincter, the, where the, you know, the entrance to the stomach or the exit from the stomach, I mean, do the sphincters get changed in these conditions? You know, again, I don't, I don't know if you can call it a sphincter, but the epiglottis as well, or... Um, it's just the tissue that comprises the uh, the organ itself is changed. Yeah, so the epiglottis is higher up. That doesn't really play a role. Um, there is a sphincter um, between the esophagus and the stomach, which is called the lower esophageal sphincter, and it's believed that in patients who have who have acid reflux, the sphincter relaxes more frequently. So effectively what happens is it's, it's almost like a leaky valve. The door between the esophagus and the stomach tends to be open more, and that open door is what allows the acid reflux to come in. But does it get, uh, you know, again, the sphincter between the, um, that at the entrance to the stomach, does that tend to get affected in any of these conditions, or is it left alone and that, that part of the tissue really doesn't suffer? Well, it's, it's more um, open so to speak. So it, it relaxes more um, and it's more open. Um, in a proportion of patients, it stays open all the time because of something called a hiatal hernia. Um, and um, there are a number of things that can cause that sphincter to relax or be more open. Um, most commonly, it's weight gain, particularly when you gain weight around the stomach. Um, the other possibilities, you know, in um, it can happen during pregnancy. There are certain foods and medications that can cause the sphincter to relax more. Um, carbonated beverages, uh, you know, fizzy water, champagne, Perrier, um, those can uh, cause the sphincter to open to release air, which will also often release um, acid reflux or stomach contents from the stomach into the esophagus. All of these things can cause the sphincter to relax 
and all of those can contribute to acid reflux. Now, I want to say that it's, it's normal for the sphincter to relax a little bit, and if, it, if your sphincter didn't relax, you wouldn't be able to burp or belch, right? And you'd be uncomfortable all the time. We all need some uh, lower, lower sphincter relaxation, but it's when it happens too often and there's too much acid coming into the esophagus that patients develop varus. So, so could something as simple as you know, having soda every single day multiple times a day, chronically relax your lower sphincter and perhaps predispose you to a bunch of problems? Absolutely, yes. And actually, one of the first things I do in my patients who reflux a lot is take them off of anything with bubbles. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't think about that. Any other um, usual phenomenon that uh, you know the common person wouldn't know about? That people are suffering with these conditions. Yeah, I think the only thing I would I would um, note is that um, you know acid reflux is common, and oftentimes um, patients will tell me that they had acid reflux for years, and then they stopped feeling their reflux. In other words, they they don't know where it went. Now this can happen for two reasons: one, because they went on acid blocking medications, but also um, when a patient develops Barrett's esophagus, and we know Barrett's is precancerous, I have actually found that they're less sensitive to the effects of reflux because the Barrett's lining um, is such that uh, it is um, a little bit thicker and it's a little bit more impervious to the effects of acid, and so. Um, just because your symptoms have disappeared or just because you're on medication doesn't mean that you may not require an endoscopy. You absolutely may. Oh, I see what you mean. So because of the change in structure of their esophagus, they may not feel the effects of the reflux, but it's probably still happening. It could still happen. It could still, it could still be happening, yes. And the other thing is that, you know, if you've been uh, taking acid-blocking medications, whether it is omeprazole or pantoprazole or lansoprazole, uh, pepsid, axid, tagamet, um, over a long period of time, the medications may be masking um, your symptoms, right? Um, they're treating your symptoms, but you may still have some of the changes um, that lead to or uh, bear its esophagus. So if you've been on those medications for a long period of time, you should still probably be seen. Yeah, what what are some of the uh, the negative effects of you know common acid blockers or proton pump inhibitors in the stomach? Yeah, so um, you know in the esophagus, of course, it reduces the effect of acid reflux and inflammation. And that's a significant advantage. Um, these medications have been around a long time. There's some concern with what we call the PPI medications. These are the proton pump inhibitors that you mentioned um, that um, they. Um, may be associated with bone loss because of a loss of calcium absorption. And um, this is probably something that does occur after a long period of time being on the medications. If you're on them for weeks or months, it's probably not an issue. But if you're on them for years, then, of course, bone density and osteoporosis are a concern. Um, you know, there's, there's a benefit to having acid in the stomach in terms of fighting infections. Um, and so... One risk of being on these medications is that patients may be more susceptible to GI infections. Um, I don't think this is, on a day-to-day -day basis, very clinically uh, relevant, especially in the United States, but it's something, theoretically, that could be of concern. Um, and there's some concern that these medications can interact with some of the medications that protect the heart, um, so that in some patients, um, there was noted at one point to be a risk. Um, in an increased risk of heart attacks or strokes in patients who are on some of the antiplatelet therapies that were designed to protect um, patients from uh, heart attacks. Um, and that's simply because these medications would interact with those medications. So I think it's something that has to be discussed be between a patient um, and their gastroenterologist and, and selectively used when needed. And I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is these medications treat the reflux. They do not treat the Barrett's or the progression to cancer. They're treating the symptoms. Right, right. And, you know, just like it seems like, uh, you know, carbonated beverages all the time could, again, weaken your sphincter and predispose you to reflux. What, what else do you think is going on that's causing reflux in people so much more often or causing heartburn? Well, um, in, in the U.S. and the Western world, it's our diets. It's the same thing that's causing increased rates of diabetes and heart disease. It's the Western diet, um, weight gain fat consumption, um, alcohol 
um, consumption um, is associated with a different type of cancer. Um, so it's not actually alcohol in this case, but um, certainly it's, it's weight gain and an increase in what we call abdominal obesity, central obesity, midline. Hmm. Okay. So looking forward, um, we talked about some of the new treatments that are going to be coming online hopefully soon. Um, any other major areas of advance that aren't as well developed but that you're excited about you think will make a big deal, big impact? Um, I think we're going to see new um, therapies um, and lower cost therapies for the treatment of esophageal and gastric cancer. So we have cryotherapy devices, but there's going to be some that are that are even more lower cost and portable. I think um, you know our own group is working on developing um, endoscopes that can be used without even a power or water supply um, and can be disinfected and reused and can be developed for less than $100. Um, so this is very promising in terms of screening for it. And then I think what we're also trying to do is um, address the need for trained professionals to be able to look for these cancers um, because you can't have expert gastroenterologists all over the world. So what we have actually tried to do is develop training apps um, that can be used on cell phones or augmented reality devices to teach um, non-gastroenterologists either an internist or a surgeon in other parts of the world, and potentially in areas of the world where you don't have physicians available, such as um, rural, rural Africa, you could have a nurse operate um, a portable endoscopic device and potentially use augmented reality to help with diagnosis of an abnormal area visually or use that um, AR platform for a telemedicine-guided uh, diagnosis from an expert that wouldn't necessarily be on site. So you could have somebody in Houston or in a major city guiding somebody um, in a rural village to diagnose an area of cancer. Mm, okay. <clears throat> well, I wouldn't have people scoping themselves at home, but yeah. I'd be, no. But yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> no. that's great. That's great. Mm, okay. Well, very good. Well, um, What's the best way for people to learn more? And, you know, unfortunately, if they have a problem, how do they start in the journey of getting help? Uh, you know, what's your suggestion? Yeah, so there's a number of, you know, papers and videos available uh, from a lot of the GI societies, the American Gastroenterologic Association and the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. Um, these are available online. Um, also, um, our own group, if you want to hear more about some of the tools and devices uh, on the Baylor College of Medicine website um, and Baylor Global Health, we talk about some of the work that we are doing. Um, and, you know, most most of the work that we're doing is federally funded um, through the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute. Um, so that also, if anyone is interested in, in um, learning or being on research protocols or looking at these tools and devices, um, those clinical trials are available. Okay, excellent. Well, Sharma, thank you for coming on the podcast. I, I appreciate your knowledge and your time. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.